Well, hi there, and welcome back to Help My Business is Growing, a podcast where we explore how to grow and build a business that is healthy and sustainable. I'm your host, Kathy Svetina. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different than others. And believe it or not, it has been more than a year since this podcast started, and I just I can't believe it. And in honor of that, we are kicking off our exciting new series called How They Did It. Every few weeks, we're going to feature CEOs, leaders, and founders who have successfully grown their businesses. We'll hear their stories, and of course, we'll ask how they did it, how they prepared, what specific steps they took, and what advice can they give to help the rest of us stay on top of our growing business. And a quick reminder, all the episodes on this podcast, including this one, come with timestamps for topics that we discuss, and each one has its own blog post as well. You can find all the links and the detailed topics in this episode's show notes. Our guest today is Fatima Abuchi. She is a founder and CEO of Agile Management Office, a high-powered boutique project management agency. After leaving the corporate world in 2016 and starting her agency, Fatima has landed high-profile global clients and shown them how they can enhance agile delivery methodologies with flexible governance, allowing them to hit their targets. Fatima shares her success story, tips, and resources you can apply to your company, and she's also going to be sharing other valuable insights on how she has grown her business. Join us. Welcome to the show, Fatima. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being here. I am super excited about this conversation because this is going to be a little bit different than what we usually do. And Mm -hmm. this is going to be a part of our new series that we started, How They Did It. And I'm super excited about this because you run a successful project management boutique consulting company. And you started this business back in 2016 and you left your corporate world. I'm someone who's done the same, and I'm always curious to hear, what made you leave the corporate world in the first place? First of all, thanks for having me, and hopefully there'll be a lot of um, value that we get out of this conversation for your listeners. I think for me, this is, there was a couple of things in it. There was a pivotal moment that was sort of a decision point, which was why 2016 happened. But before that, just sort of going back a few steps, I spent almost now 20 years in the corporate career and sort of climbing the corporate ladder and trying to do all of those things that you want to do usually when you're young and entrepreneurial. I spent a lot of time in environments where I felt that there was situations where maybe they weren't necessarily treated fairly, you know, sort of being involved in being bullied and things like that through corporate and finding people brushing it under the carpet, et cetera. So there was no accountability. And also there was some challenges around having people that would actually sort of listen to you both in that situation. And then even when we were doing some of the project management stuff, um, I came off the back of the the most successful program for a big four bank here. And as a result of that, you would expect that all of the learnings from that would naturally transition to other areas of the organization. That's what I would do in a business. Unfortunately, just because of politics and other things like that, they just weren't paying attention to myself and others in the team at the time. I was working closely with a number of um, very senior managers and collectively we were trying to promote change within the organisation and sort of bigger management just didn't want to listen to us. So I said to myself, if I leave and come back as a consultant, maybe they'll pay attention. And coincidentally, or maybe intentionally, later on, I've been back to that organization as a consultant and they have listened, but they couldn't, they wouldn't listen when I was in there as one of one of them. So it was really about taking the opportunity to be autonomous in the way that I was working and actually work with collaborative mindset and a collaborative team that would enable us to really experiment, be agile in our in our agility and actually try new things. And I just wasn't getting that in corporate. So I felt like it was time to move on. You're not the first person who said that. I've heard so many stories where employees have great ideas about how to change the corporate structure, they change the corporate, how people are doing things, and they're just not being taken seriously. But when the consultant comes in, when you actually pay five, four, ten times the price that you would for an employee, people actually start listening. Oh, 100 percent. And that was case in point for what I experienced, as well as others, of course. It just seemed unless you were the right position in the hierarchical structure, and I was reasonably sort of high towards the end of my corporate sort of full-time career, but they didn't. And one of the challenges also was 
as you just pointed out, I have seen organizations bring in very large consulting firms that have charged five times or 10 times as much as what their employees with a little bit of coaching could actually do maybe 60 or 70% off. So I think organizations need to listen and pay a bit more attention, I think, to their staff. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. So you left the corporate world and you started the company. How were those first years for you? And I can I relate to this because when you leave the corporate world, you're really good at what you do. There's a core skill set that you have. But then when you run a business, it's a very different type of environment because you're also responsible for sales. You're responsible for marketing. You're responsible for management of other people. If you have other employees, other people helping you, it's you become a business owner. You're not just the expert in what you're good at, but there are other areas as well. How was that transition for you? So I think it's probably worth mentioning that I experimented with business four years prior and I sort of was playing around with this idea that I wanted to take my big corporate learnings and apply them to small businesses. Now, needless to say, I was also doing a number of other things, trying to run events and facilitating dance classes and making baby clothes. Like just there were so many things I was trying whilst also maintaining a full-time job. And so I got the opportunity to learn a lot from experimenting but not really risking my day job basically I was doing work on the weekends and after hours at the time so by the time 2016 came and I decided to take the plunge the big big decision was first and foremost not being listened to but secondly we had um, through word of mouth people had heard in a very large federal government agency the work that we had done and so they actually sought us out to come and help them and so the first literally the first few months, we had secured a a large tender. And so we had to get serious really quickly because we had to start formalizing this business and start focusing on getting the finances right, um, focusing on what we're going to do for marketing after this particular engagement one, how our processes were going to work. The good news is, as part of the work that I do day to day in my corporate career, it's about project management, it's about effectiveness, it's about efficiency, it's about making sure many, many, many projects and and multi-millions of dollars of projects are run as effectively as possible with the right sort of office support, if you like, from a project management office perspective. So I had a bit of a head start on that and I used the learnings from that and my career to actually start building out the framework and the foundations to grow the business. That's fabulous. That. Having that background and processes, and and I always say it's the processes that save the business, really. Once you have that done, it's so easy to onboard new people and offboard if you don't need that type of help. So let's dive more into this processes in your business. How did that look like when you first started and how did that evolve throughout the growth of the business? So first and foremost, the biggest starting point for us beyond the experimental years, I would call it, we had to work out how we took a, basically a piece of work that was going to be a tender. Now, I'd never done a tender before at that time. So I had to figure out how do we process tender? So we needed sales processes. So I actually spent a lot of time researching, speaking to different people that are have been involved in that space and starting to pull the pieces together, just like we would in a project, breaking down the, the work and starting to figure out what exactly was essential for us to be able to get the submission of the tender over the line and then to be able to support if we were successful. And we had a really good chance at the time just based on the feedback we'd had. So sales and the execution of the sales process and writing tenders was something that I had to spend a considerable amount of time getting my head around. I will say that since then, it's been a good six years, we've done dozens of tenders, some of which we've won and some which we've not, that we've learnt, learnt through that process. So sales was the first and foremost most important part. And then it was about making sure that we had the right foundations to execute if we were successful. And so that involved not only understanding how we were going to take the the sale, the win, which we did get, but actually put it into practice and what sort of resources we need. So we need to start thinking about our processes to onboard and offboard. We needed to start thinking about how we were going to pay people. Now, for a long time, I was so scared of the concept of payroll because it didn't make sense to me because I'd always been a career contractor that I avoided hiring people who needed to be PAYG payrolled. I actually chose to go for contractors instead, which in 
in Australia was like just easier. Now I regret that decision because I know that there, it was just as easy just having the right, you know, financial support on board, which I do have now. So really it was about starting to unpack. We need to onboard the team, then we need to execute the projects. And then once we were delivering on the projects, it was about, well, how do we maintain that customer service beyond that? How do we make sure that we can now, in parallel to delivering that, market to be able to bring engagement and awareness to other other work opportunities as well because one tender is not going to support a growing business and so we started to break it down and work on things in an incremental way. And you mentioned having the right financial support especially in terms of the payroll. How did that look like for you? Did you hire a bookkeeper? Did you hire an accountant? Did you have an outside payroll company? How did that look like? So firstly, we when I started experimenting the four years prior, I started through the advice of people that I'd worked with, started an Excel spreadsheet like most people do and started yeah. to use an automated spreadsheet to start calculating my super and, you know, my BAS payments and all these sorts of different activity statement things that needed to happen. So I spent a lot of time on government websites to research and understand what were the requirements as, a, as what I was called at the time as a sole trader before moving into an actual business before now into a proprietary limited company. Company, which I believe is similar to an LLC for you guys. So I started basically with a manual process in Excel. And then I realized that when I started having more than one paying customer that I needed to move into a software program. At the time, I looked around for feedback, was part of a lot of business groups and seeing people talk about a product, which you may know it's called Zero, now leading a leading small business software and decided to try to set that up myself. So I did attempt it and I think I did an okay job. At the time, moving just from a sole trader to sort of a business, I actually did find an accountant who I used very sparingly just because of cost pressures at the time. But one of the things that was really important is as we evolved the business a couple of years on, we then hired a bookkeeping firm. And interestingly, when they did a review of the way that we'd set up the software platform, they realized there was quite a lot of things in it that maybe weren't set up properly. And as a result of fixing those problems and working with a professional, we ended up finding sort of about four or $5,000 in revenue that I didn't know I had that I could actually claim back. So it paid itself in dividends by bringing on the professionals, but I obviously took a little bit of time for me to get that. And then now we've been using that platform and have expanded and we've linked that to our CRM now. And so With all the work we do with really large corporates, we've now got solid financial and accounting processes, systems, tools and frameworks and experts working with us, including two accountants and a bookkeeper who work with us from time to time. Yeah, and it's a work in progress. Like I always say to my clients too, a room wasn't built in a day. It, it does take time and effort to make it right. And having a framework really, really helps with that as well. So now that you have all of this in the business, how is it, like, when you look at your financial statements, how is it when comparing to previous years, is it better? Are you getting the type of information that you need? How do you make financial decisions now versus before when you didn't have these people in, in the business? So before it was pretty much majority of the, the work we were doing or I was doing was a personal services income. It was myself. So decisions was how much money did I want to take home that week? And anything I spent beyond that was all, again, we just reduced how much money I was earning. As an independent contractor, that was quite a sort of tough decision to try to think of how we would invest my own money and have less holidays and do all of those things. But when I started adding employees and sort of we started doing some recruitment activities and doing some large tenders and some other projects, it obviously made it a lot more of a a bigger decision, something that involved a lot of financial data. So we would look at sort of looking at margins. We would look at our expenses on a monthly basis. I remember scouring line by line our financial monthly reports that we receive and made sure that not coming from a financially savvy background and and not really being great at maths in high school, I actually made sure that I understood all of the data in our financial statements that we were receiving from the bookkeeping and accounting team and made sure I understood that to a point where I could use that information to then be able to make informed decisions and questions that I would want to ask. Sometimes I'd ask the same question two or three times just to really make sure I'm clear on why something means a particular thing within, within the spreadsheet. We also then supplemented that knowledge of around that process and made sure that we also were continuously improving how and where we were spending money. So for example, we spent a lot of financial in marketing and that's really helped our brand over the last six years. But also there's been times where I've had to spend more on on wages because we needed to bring in a specialized skill set like 
a recent hire as a head of strategy that we've been working with for some really large client works as well. So using the sort of financial reporting and processes that we receive and our profit and loss statements and all of those things, we actually use that data then to make decisions and and not just at the time, but also thinking about things, you know, six, 12 months in advance and beyond that as well. I would love it if you could just a couple of questions or a couple of things that you look at in your financial statements that are really relevant to you and why did you exactly pick those? I would love if you could give us some examples. Yeah, so one of the things that sort of keeps standing out, I don't know the terminology they use, but we've we've been building IP and trademarking, you know, practices and processes and frameworks and all of these sorts of things. And there was a, a line item in our statements that referred to sort of retained IP or intellectual property of some sort. Mm-hmm. Now, at the time, I was really not sure how the value against that line item had had been growing and where it had been coming from. So I remember having a conversation with the accountant to try to understand and unpack a little bit more around where that line had been coming from. And then obviously it was a very lengthy explanation, which I won't get into. That was one of the things that really caught my attention. The other one that also caught my attention was also we realized that we had different revenue streams. So we have recruitment, we do consulting, we do advisory work. There's lots of different revenue streams. And it was really hard for me to work out where to invest more financial energy, time, et cetera, in without understanding what revenue stream was making us, I guess, the the most profit. So I then challenged the simple line item of sales and we broke that up into sales, other sales, recruitment, sales workshops, et cetera. And that really helped to change the way that we were perceiving our revenue and also being able to use that information to make better decisions. But there are things that if you don't ask your bookkeeper or your accountant, they just stay there and you just assume that they're correct. But you need to challenge these things sometimes to make sure you're, you're aware of what's going on in your financial statements. Yeah, you bring a very good point about making sure that the chart of accounts that you're using is very specific to you, to your business, and it's giving you the information that you really need to see what's happening in the business. And this is a perfect example of just having a lump sum of sales. It's great. It goes up and down, but you're not really getting the information. Where is it coming from? Is it coming from consulting? Is it coming from advisory? What what type of thing is it? So yeah, having that having that breaking down into different accounts where it's like little buckets, it's so valuable. And and I love that you bring that example up because that is one of the first thing that I when I see that with my clients, when I see just the sales, like we need to start drilling this down because now you can, we can start looking at expenses against those sales. We can start looking at the margins. I mean, there's so much stuff that you can do with that information, but you have to have it broken down to what makes sense for you and for your business. So I, I love this example. 100%. And you also talked about hiring people and being really nervous about having people in payroll. And this is this is not unusual at all. But I do want to ask you, like now when you are hiring people, are you going through a sort of like a financial forecast that you have in the business? How do you make those type of decisions now? So the benefit that I have is coming from a large corporate background and and being involved in large multi-million dollar programs. I've been used to managing resource profiles that have hundreds of resources in them, people starting and stopping at different times, people from different currencies, different countries, people different skill sets, some coming from consultancies, recruit, uh, uh, contractors, permanent, all of that. So I had a really good exposure to that and worked quite closely with our corporate finance departments and HR and, and secu- uh, supply chain procurement, etc. So that just led to us having more refined processes in the business, which we have now. So we have workforce management as a capability in our business, and it is something that I spend a lot of time on. So we have a clear view of what we call the core team. And though that team sort of usually is sort of the similar size at, at all times, but then we scale up with contractors or consultants, depending on what the need is for clients. And many times those contractors and consultants are people we work with regularly, as opposed to sort of just brand new people, because we have quite a close-knit culture and uh, team sort of collaborative way of working. So we have a workforce management process, we have a core team, and then we scale up and down based on a couple of factors. One is client needs. So if we bring in on a new project or a new engagement, what does that look like? What do we need? And we start factoring in how we're going to move resources around to support that. And then secondly, it's also what are the products and or services that we're working on within the business? So working 
on the business, sorry, in the business, not on the business. And actually, sorry, other way around, you know what I'm saying? Basically working, working in that space and thinking about what is it that we need to develop or further to grow our business. So for example, at the moment, we're working on some product development activity. Now, our team has experience in project management and we've touched products, but are we as expert as product as we are projects? No. So we've brought in a product person do we need them full time? No. We we have the advisory services of a product expert, but we actually leverage our own core team who are experts in executing projects to then develop and apply the the recommendations that have come from our product expert and vice versa. So it's a very cohesive process. We're very comfortable with where what our capabilities and skills are, and we know where where our skills are not there and where we can we bring in the experts to make sure we get the best outcome for ourselves and for our customers. And where do you go and find these experts? Do you look for like on a job site? Do you go to your network and ask for recommendations? Where, where do you find these type of experts when you need them? So there's a number of different sources, but first and foremost, it's through our network. And that is what I find as part of the recruitment work we do with clients. We have had really good success rate. And that's because we recruit from within our network, people we've built relationships with over the last 20 years, et cetera. So that's a number one first point of call. Then it's through conversations with people in our network. So are we having a conversation with someone about a project and then they'll mention that they know that John Smith or Sally's looking for an opportunity. And so we then include them to what we call the merit pool. And the merit pool is basically a, a list of people that as soon as we get engagements, they have been validated, verified, reference checked, et cetera. And we can actually invite them to partake in projects. So it streamlines your onboarding process end to end. And then beyond that, we obviously use platforms like LinkedIn where we advertise for, for jobs. So we also use, we've used Seek, which is another big one that we use as well. It's very similar to Indeed. And then also there's a few other sort of platforms here and there where we're looking for freelancers online that we might use like Upwork, for example. So really it, it's blended, but networking is the first point. And most, almost all of the work that we've done, we've had onshore. So most of our team are actually dedicated full-time working with us. We have very little outsourced or out offshore work, have had it in the past from time to time, but we find that working together collaboratively, ideally in person, makes a lot of difference. So we've had people that have worked with us, in uh, team members in Serbia, Denmark, and New Zealand as well. Yeah, and sometimes there's also a benefit too, like working around the clock. If they're on a, on a different time zone, they can do the project while you're asleep and doing other things. I mean, there is certain yeah. benefits to that as well. Or maybe if you okay. need someone who, who has that specific like culture knowledge as well. So there's benefit to it. You know, before we started recording, you mentioned that you actually completely bootstrap the company to seven figures. That's also another thing that I'm, I'm fascinated about and, and I want to hear more about like, how did you manage to do that? Did you keep a very close tab on your cash inflows and outflows? What are some of the things that you think allowed you to get to the bootstrapping so that you were able to do this and bring the company to seven figures? I'm really interested in like, how did you manage to do that? It's probably worth noting that at the early days of the business, I had a plan for where I'm going and where I'm taking it. And, and I still have that plan and it's evolved over time. But one of the reasons why we didn't really go and seek any funding, despite other people doing it and recommending it, is I really didn't know where to start or what that looked like or how that worked. And also I'm really specific in the way I like to run things so that we can have the same level of quality and, and whatnot and have bringing in external funding, I know will change the dynamics of the business. So that was part of the reason why we didn't do it at the beginning. And then as we evolved, one of the things I realized is the only way to grow a business by self-funding is through bringing on additional headcount that could be supporting the revenue stream that we had. So looking at different parts of revenue beyond just myself initially being the consultant to starting to bring on additional team members. So we started looking at multiple passive revenue streams and also recurring revenue streams that we could look at investing in. So recruitment was one that really did help us to, to grow the business. We also started creating products that people could purchase. We then started creating smaller services that small to medium businesses could leverage outside of the bigger, very large corporate, big T1, T2 business type um, structures. So we started to think about all of the different types of paths to revenue that we could take. And then what I would do is I would forego significant profit through that to actually reinvest it in the business. And that includes my own day-to-day -day 
rates, I would, you know, reduce that by a percentage and then reinvest that in the business. So it was all about reinvesting every sort of dollar that we got into the people that were building the business for the future and also finding additional revenue streams and also doing something that I call sort of pairing. So when working with a customer on a particular, so let's say consulting engagement to help them with sort of statements of work or a project, whatever it might be, we'd say, well, we can also provide you the resources to then deliver that long term. So then we would start bringing in contractors or permanent headcount and and, and obviously and see, seek revenue from that perspective. So for me, it was forced choice to begin with. And ever since then, I've not really sort of opened my sort of door to, to funding or revenue or anything like that, because I think I'm having too much fun just having control over how we're running this and having the experimentation and not having someone tell me what to do. And I think that's really helped. So hopefully, maybe that will change in future. But for now, it's been a good decision because we don't have a huge debt over our head that we have to pay off and the pressure that comes from VC funding or or investors, etc. So but who knows, that may change. Yeah, you're right. I mean, and tempting it is to have an investor in the business, having someone have a stake in the business is always one of the most expensive way to fund the business because you lose that 100% control that you have over it and you are you have to provide statements you have to provide the rationale why you're doing things you're doing so you lose a little bit of the control of of your business so it's a balancing act right do i need the money or can i figure this out on my own so it's really kudos to you that you were able to figure this out question for you regarding the productizing the sum of parts of your business. How did that work out for you? And what exactly did you productize? So a core part of our business and the sort of concept of it from 2016 when we first started was we, well, I say we, but I originally, but my team has helped evolve it. I developed a way of doing things that I believed would be more effective, more efficient and agile in terms of agility for businesses. And that was a way of doing anything project, program or portfolio related that brought in the focus of governance as well. But it was flexible and adaptable. So I have come up with a method called the AMO way method. Now, it is something that we're sort of now starting to package up in a better way, whereas for the last six years, we've been testing and trying and applying. Mm -hmm. We've applied the process that we use for that product initially internally. We worked with a major university in Denmark. To, to prove the concept works with students, which it did. We used it in a really large, our second largest supermarket chain here and received the honours for sort of the high, most successful project and all of these other award, award wins. And then we started applying it in small and medium businesses to see if they could apply. And now that we've done that, we're so confident with the way that we've developed our process and our framework that we're turning that into a product. And that product, the AMO way method model, if you like, is a product that we, we are now bringing together and underpinning it by what we call our core capabilities. The core capabilities is if you think about for example, in, in the finance space, it might be bookkeeping as a capability. But in our world of project management, it might be project cost management. And so we're packaging up all of these products, these capabilities, and we want to then now be able to use those by offering them to clients so they can apply them themselves. So we're actually taking what we've learned works really well and now putting it into a, a proposition that clients can access, hopefully self-serve, and then also leverage our advisory or delivery if they want some additional support to execute that in if their business is medium to large, for example. So they're two sort of main products. And then beyond that, we've also got our thought leadership, big rock content pieces. Some of these are not products that we are charging for, but they are very much go a long way in driving awareness around what we do. And that's something that we tend to do maybe one or two pieces a year. And we've got one coming out at the moment around agility in banking, as an example. Mm -hmm. So really just looking at what the market is asking for at a particular time, but leveraging what we've now proven and tested with our AMO way and our capability in a box models. And now we're working at how to productize that in a way that it can be self-sufficient, which for the most of the part of six years has been us executing, but now we're flipping that on its head. And, and that's where the product expertise is coming in to help us do that. And is that something that you are seeing going even more into the future that you're going to be more towards a productized version of the company? Yeah, absolutely. So we're hoping that the AMO way model, as well as the capability box or Kayab for sure, going to be um, something that grows in in use for for organisations that can then use it themselves. So beyond the the small group of companies, twenty 
20, 25 companies we've worked with, we want to double, triple, quadruple that. But we can't do that on our own. So what we want is people eventually to become practitioners of this model and actually be able to apply that themselves in their organizations and get the results that we've been getting because they've followed a proven model for success. So I think over time that'll become something that we will end up doing and we're hoping to evolve our partnerships as well with some of the universities to further inform the next generation of project leaders in a model that is agnostic of, you know, all of the the really great methodologies out there but it's about bringing together and being really pragmatic for how we execute change and that's what the AMO way model is about that's absolutely fantastic and i can i can see the benefits for small businesses big businesses large businesses it's across the board the name of this podcast is help my businesses growing and we recognize that businesses have these growing type of pains as they grow what do you think was one of the biggest growing pains for you in the past, what is it now as you are at the stage that you are right now? It's a really good question, actually. I can definitely say what's now, but thinking about in the past, I think I, I go back to the sort of financial landscape of things. So when we sort of started getting more serious, we really needed to create the right framework around the way we managed our account process, accounts, payable receipt, all of that. For mm-hmm. the very long time, I was responsible for that until we brought in brought in the expertise and and expert help. That is where I've invested beyond marketing the most money because the, you know, accounting costs and bookkeeping costs, but they've really helped to make sure we're meeting all of the regulatory requirements and the, you know, the legal requirements and all of that sort of stuff. So that's something you can't get wrong. And that was a really big eye opener for me because coming from a background of, of where I came from and, and my, and my sort of secondary college years, maths was not my strong point. And I really struggled to begin with that. So that's probably what was one of the biggest challenges for us. And then obviously finding ways to bring people on board that were not always contractors. So learning about payroll processes and what that actually meant versus what I predicted that, sorry, what I thought that it meant and, and actually was wrong. So that was probably a big challenging and pivotal turning point for us now. We're in a little bit of a different boat because we have gotten to a good point from a revenue perspective, but it's not, it's all well and good to get to that point. But now it's about sustainment. We need to sustain that and sustain the growth. So this is where we're looking beyond what we did well for the last six years is only one piece of the puzzle. Now we need to look at what do we add to what we've done well and the things that work really well, we expedite and grow. And then things that maybe aren't working so well, we decide to pause or stop. And this is why when working with a, a head of strategy, an ex Garner executive who's a head of strategy to help just guide that, that conversation moving forward. And one of those things is really differentiating between what we can offer practitioners in the market versus businesses. And that's something that for a very long time, it was a little bit blurred. And now we're just working to refine that. So I would say that sort of clarity around customer segmentation, evolving our processes around the strategy work that we're doing and working out how to sustain our revenue moving forward. So we don't have dips in the business as we've had in the past, as we've been growing. It'd be probably the core things. And where do you see the company ideally in five, five years? Where would you like to see it? So this sort of vision that I've had is that we get to a point where the AMO Way model and the capability in a box solution is being used in a significant number of companies. I'm thinking 200 companies at least within the next five years. And it is something that people can use and uplift their own capabilities without having to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars a month in consulting fees. And that's because that's what I needed when I was growing up, going through my small business. So that's one part of it. And that is where we need to bring model in place where we can create partnerships and licensing and, and have practitioners who can all leverage, use and grow in this, in this model that's continuously and perpetually evolving. It's not a set and forget type thing. So I'm definitely um, keen on that. And then the second thing is as we grow the business and focus on, on doing that really well. I hope that it will get to a point where on a personal note, I spend a lot of time in the mental health space. And one of my life goals, maybe not in five years, probably in 15 or 20, is actually to build a mental health retreat. So everything I'm doing in the corporate business now, and maybe we bring on partners in future, is to help effectively realize a dream to build a mental health retreat for those suffering from from anxiety and depression. So that's sort of where the personal goal is. And then the business goal is to see the AMO way model and the capability in a box solution in as many businesses as possible with proven results the way that we've been able to get in the last six years. 
That's a fabulous goal. And what got you into this mental health space? Is there like a personal passion of yours? What got you into that? I've had generalized anxiety for most of my adult life, which is part and, part and parcel of the reason. And then beyond that, I've also got significant members of the family that have anxiety or depression or both or have had it at points in time. So I was surrounded by it. But for me, the biggest point that was really most important is I don't want mental health, anxiety, depression, for example, particularly anxiety, which I can talk to a lot more closely, to be something that holds people back. So I've been trying to demonstrate that you can have a corporate career, you can grow a business, you can hold down jobs and still be managing and dealing with a mental health disorder, such as anxiety, which is in in my case, what I have. So I'm hoping that I've been proving that over the last 20 years, and I want to continue to do that. But because I know that there is a lot more people out there that could benefit from just the learnings I've had from working with psychologists and counsellors and things like that. I want to expand that and give people more opportunity to get what I call recovery and recovery for them could be, for my sister, it was getting to the mailbox at the front of her house for a period of time. For others, it might be just, you know, waking up. Others, it might be travelling around the world, which was one of my fears a few years ago. So, yeah, that's a real big passion for me from a family perspective and then also the desire to see, again, more people helped and I think I could do that with with the idea of evolving beyond what we're already doing today, day to day, into something bigger. We've talked about your business and bootstrapping into seven figures and having all these fabulous processes and, and dreams about where the business should be. How do you take care of your mental health? Because that is so much pressure on you in terms of, you know, developing the business, running it. And now you have all these people in your business. You're responsible for them. You're responsible for the livelihood. How do you manage your mental health in that space? It's a really good question. And I always sort of, it's probably one of the common ones to get asked. So I think part of also working for myself means that I get to set my boundaries and I get to choose when I work, how I work and when I don't want to work. So there are days where I may not feel like working. For example, I was recently had a bit of a virus. So I decided for the last three weekends, I wasn't going to work. And I didn't. And that's very different to me working the previous weekends, which is quite normal for me. I do a lot of work on making sure that I continuously spend time. I see a psychologist regularly. I have ever since I was 17 years old. And that really helps to unpack situations that create anxiety and and understand where they've come from so that they don't continue to impact life. I also do a lot of the things that you would expect around I use sleep stories and we, you know, I do some meditation, not as much as I should. Obviously, exercise is a big part. I could be doing more of that as well and spending time with family and friends. So one of my rules is I never prioritize work over family and friends function. So I never miss a function just for work. doesn't matter what deadline we've got coming up. I take the time to make sure I get sunlight whenever I can, of course. And I also decide to to take time off and not be judging myself if I decide that I want to spend half a day doing nothing or if I want a day off, et cetera. So for me personally, that's what I do. The stress of the business and everything in the last few years, particularly with the COVID environment, has absolutely elevated levels of stress beyond what it's ever been in my life. And that is because I thankfully was able to keep my staff employed through COVID. But that just meant we we would obviously have to sacrifice other things like profit. But knowing that we're talking and being open about it and being really supported by my husband as well has made a big difference. But just not judging yourself and being too hard and making the effort to actually try to resolve anything that is causing you that anxiety. At the end of the day, it's you can only do so much and you have to give yourself a break. A hundred percent. And I always also say, you know, your mind is the most valuable asset when you're running the business, because if that goes, there's not much you have left. That and the health. A hundred percent. You've got to set boundaries and they have to be strict boundaries. I'm going to start this time, finish this time. You can't just start 7 a.m. and then work until 7 p.m. every single day of the week because you will get burnt out. I've seen that firsthand. So I, I refuse to get into that situation. And then the other thing that has a lot of value is planning. Planning has been absolutely critical for me from day one. And that is planning, like knowing what's coming up. So you don't get to a point where you've got a day left on a tender and you've got 40 hours of work left and you just can't afford that time. So planning quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily, I can quite clearly tell you what's my day look like today? What have I got on? And I know exactly what clients I need to respond to, et cetera, et cetera. That will go a long way to minimizing the stress, but also being flexible that it may change, but have a plan to start with and then go from there. 
Yeah. And I think one of the most anxiety provoking for me is if I come into the office and I'm like, what do I work on today? It's, it's the worst feeling because it feels like you have to work on everything and you know that nothing's going to get done because when you work on everything, you work on nothing. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And it takes a really long time for, for people to realize that I know it did for me. I know that I have an advantage because I had to do planning of really large scale projects and programs in corporate. So you have no choice but to meet reporting deadlines and to submit something to finance and, and all of that that jazz. But you've got to put those similar boundaries in your business as well. So for example, one of the things that I heavily recommend is scheduling things. So we schedule content days rather than waiting to get around to doing marketing content. No, we have a content day and we have a three weekly marketing planning meeting for what's coming up in the newsletter and what we're going to do in, in the month ahead. We have um, sales meeting each week. What are the leads we need to follow up with and why hasn't this lead responded? We have product meetings. So we have lots of meetings that are blocked into the diary and that forces the conversation around what we need to do to progress those streams or those functions better. And that goes a long way rather than just relying on you know us thinking, remembering, because you get busy and things fall by the wayside. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been really enlightening and I really, really appreciate you sharing your journey with us. It's been an absolute fabulous conversation. No, thank you. And um, thanks for the invitation. Hopefully the, the, your listeners get some value out of it today. And before we go, if you could please let us know, where can the listeners find you? Definitely LinkedIn. Just search search my name on LinkedIn would be the first place. And then also you can go to our website, which is www.agile, A-G-I-L-E, managementoffice.com, or one word. Awesome. And all of these will actually be in the show notes as well. So you can go take a look at them and click on it and you can find her. Thank you so much. Thank you. 